It would come to be called Fordlandia. Two and a half million acres of virgin rainforest, the size of Connecticut, in the heart of the Amazon. And almost as soon as Henry Ford had wired the $125,000 that made him the sole owner of this vast tract of jungle, he began transforming it. The Ford Motor Company is ever seeking ways and materials to improve its products. One of the latest enterprises of the company is the development of a rubber plantation in Brazil. Rubber for tires was his stated purpose. But as with many things concerning Ford, there was a grander vision. In the primordial wilderness, he planned to build a modern utopia modeled on small town America. He came to believe that he was not only an economic entrepreneur, but a prophet of proper living. Henry says simple, plain, honest, hardworking people. That's the backbone of not just the United States, it's the backbone of the world. And I know how you have to live in order to achieve that. Ford practiced what he preached. Through his own fierce determination, he had risen from obscurity to become one of the most famous and powerful men in the country. With the Model T, the most successful car in history, and the groundbreaking $5 a day wage, Ford ushered in the modern world. The Model T greatly expanded Americans' mobility, knitting America very close together at the same time that it opened American sense of what was possible. So he liberated at the individual level, the human spirit. Henry Ford was a revolutionary. He changed all of 20th century America. We're living in Henry Ford's world right now. But no matter his success, Ford remained restless and driven, always seeking to control what lay just beyond his grasp. The creator of an urban industrial age he longed for the simpler era he had helped destroy. One of the nation's richest men, he despised the wealthy and feared a vast conspiracy threatened to bring him down. A hero to many ordinary Americans, he battled his workers and bullied those who looked up to him, including his only son. What is it like to carry around so much power that the ordinary wear and tear of reality that most of us deal with all the time that keep us pretty sane is absent? As Henry Ford liked to tell it, his was a rags to riches tale. He was a child genius who fled an oppressive father to become one of the most successful entrepreneurs the world had ever seen. It was a great story, but only the last part was true. Since young manhood, if not childhood, Henry Ford had felt a certain sense of destiny that he was slated to do important things. He liked to picture himself to others as a kind of heroic individual who climbed to success against the odds. In fact, Henry Ford was the eldest son of a caring, successful Michigan farm couple. His parents expected all their children to work alongside them on the land. But when Henry found the work tedious and began obsessing over the machines that might make farm life easier, his parents indulged him. They allowed him to neglect his chores and set up a workbench for him in the kitchen. 
Not only would he take apart wristwatches and put them back together, but he would study every machine he saw. Henry's father, William Ford, understood that his son longed to learn more about machinery. When Henry turned 16, William arranged for him to stay with an aunt in Detroit and even found Henry a job. On a cold day in December, 1879, Henry walked the nine miles from his family farm to the city. There, he would reinvent himself. For more than a decade, Ford worked long hours in one shop after another forging a career as an expert machinist. By the time he was 31, he was chief engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company, the pioneer in providing electricity to American cities. As exciting as Edison was, Ford's passion lay elsewhere. The notion of horseless carriage was in the air. And he and all of his buddies, they just devoured magazines and newspaper articles. And I think Ford just soaked that up. Transportation in America was terrible once you got away from the railroads. Terrible. It was an enormous burden. I mean, if you're living on the farm, getting around on land is one of the biggest problems people have. At the dawn of the automobile industry in the 1890s, most people saw the car as a luxury item for the wealthy. Ford had a different vision. He never forgot his feelings of isolation living on the farm and imagined that others shared his longing for greater mobility. If he could build a reliable horseless carriage, Ford believed, he could change people's lives. He wanted to really change the tenor of his times he is going to transform the world by building a type of cheap car that everybody could have. All the late nights and long weekends, the hard-earned cash spent on sheet iron and gasoline, the false starts and wrong turns, none of it mattered when on June 4th, 1896, Ford drove his horseless carriage through the streets of Detroit for the first time. As the rickety vehicle bounced down Grand River Avenue, a friend cycled ahead to warn pedestrians out of the way. The quadricycle, as Ford dubbed it, had 28-inch bicycle wheels, a top speed of 20 miles per hour, and no brakes. It couldn't go in reverse, and was prone to overheating. Yet wherever he went, the quadricycle drew crowds of curious bystanders. Soon, he attracted the attention of more than a dozen of Detroit's most prominent leaders, including the mayor himself, all eager to invest in Ford and his machine. For some people, when they walk into a room, you notice them. He has an inner self-confidence. That means the way he carries himself you're going to notice it. Within three years of the inaugural drive, Ford had quit his engineering job. In a brick building on Cass Avenue in Detroit, he assembled a team of 13. The Detroit Automobile Company, incorporated on August 5, 1899, was one of the first car manufacturing firms in the city, but it wouldn't be the last. The automobile industry was exploding. 57 other firms were founded the same year. Within two years, there would be more than 100. There are all kinds of people that Henry Ford knows that are tinkering and playing and trying to, you know, produce a prototype. All men, all interested in machines, but all without a big picture view of what this could become. A company spokesman hailed Ford's first model as near perfect. But when it went on sale, it looked more like a horse-drawn delivery wagon without the horse. It was high-sided, heavy, and due to problems with the ignition and carburetor, 
rarely ran for more than a few minutes at a time. His backers pushed for a new luxury model that was more reliable. But Ford stalled, determined to work out engine and design problems before building another car. And he would move parts around, and then he would test it, and then he would go back and move some more parts. There's a kind of both breadth of vision in that kind of activity, but there's also a kind of monomaniacal focus. No detail is too small, but the overall objective, make the thing better, is never lost sight of. As his investors increased the pressure, Ford bought himself time by having his employees make parts for vehicles he never planned to build. Meanwhile, he continued to experiment. His investors want to make an expensive car to sell to wealthy people. Ford disagrees fundamentally. He wants to create a car for the people. He's trying to perfect an invention. In order to keep doing the trial runs and get it better, it's going to take a lot of capital to keep testing, keep testing. Finally realizing they were being duped, his backers pulled the plug. In the three years that the fledgling car industry had existed in America, Henry Ford had managed to squander his chance to be part of it. And he knew exactly who to blame, his investors. From here in, Ford declared, my shop is always gonna be my shop. I'm not going to have a lot of rich people tell me what to do. He hated the people that invested in him, loathed them. These were the scum of America to Henry Ford. These are the people that looked down on the slang of the farm and the kinfolk of his that had worked the land for generations. He did not like these people. <laughs> 